So before getting into the changes I'm making to the three cheese grilled cheese that launched my food career, we first got to make our tomato soup. And since it's August, we're using some beautiful fresh heirloom tomatoes. So let's just jump right into it. Now, usually we'd use a Roma tomato for our roasted tomato soup on our food truck, which we've covered in a video a few years back. I wanted to revisit it and make a few changes. And one of them is since it's August, we're gonna utilize beautiful heirloom tomatoes. Now, if it's not August, you can totally use Romas, but we've got beautiful heirloom tomatoes to use, so we're gonna make our roasted tomato soup with those. Now I've got a few varieties of heirlooms on hand. I wanna go through and pick the most overripe ones, the softer ones, maybe they have a little bruise to them. Those are gonna be perfect for soup. We get a sheet tray and I'm gonna coat it with some olive oil and then I'm gonna take a knife and I'm gonna just remove the core of the tomatoes. Then I'm gonna cut them in half and just, you see how beautiful these are. These are gonna make just an amazingly flavorful tomato soup. I'm just gonna cut them into wedges, roughly, just get them onto the sheet tray. Once we've chopped up all of the tomatoes, then we can start to prepare the vegetables. Here I got a bulb of fennel. I'm gonna cut the bulb of fennel in half and then remove the cores. And then I'm just gonna give that a rough chop, add that into the sheet tray with the tomatoes. Next, I've got some mirepoix, a little carrot, celery, and onions. Two if they're small, one carrot if it's a big one. And then I'm just gonna chop it up into little half moons. I'm basically gonna do the same with the celery and the onion. We really don't need any sort of like precise cuts. We can roughly chop everything up, toss them all into the sheet tray. I'm also gonna take one whole head of garlic. I'm gonna smash the cloves up and toss them into the mix as well. I'm gonna coat the mix with a little bit more olive oil, season it with some salt, and then we're gonna pop that into a preheated 450 degree oven for about 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, the vegetables should be nice and roasted and their flavor should be concentrated. And then we're gonna take a Dutch oven and we're gonna transfer those vegetables into the Dutch oven, scraping and deglazing the sheet tray wherever it might need it. Once the vegetables are in there, we're gonna take about two cups of a V8 juice, pour that in there. Then we're gonna go with three cups of of a vegetable stock and we're gonna reserve about a cup of the stock as needed for later when we blend the soup. Then we're gonna measure out a half cup of paprika. I know it sounds like a lot, but it is one of like the key components of this soup. Then we're gonna just tie up a little bunch of thyme, toss in a bay leaf, hit it with a little bit of salt. We didn't do this on the truck, but I like to add a little bit of sriracha, get that mixture all mixed up and then we wanna bring this whole thing up to a simmer. Then we wanna drop the heat down to a low and we wanna simmer this soup for about 30 minutes. Occasionally we're gonna check in, we're gonna give it a stir, clean up the sides of the pan. And once that 30 minutes is up, remove the thyme and the bay leaf. We're gonna turn the heat off, allow that soup to cool, and then we're gonna prepare a blender to puree the whole mixture. I'm gonna get my blender out. Now, just so you know, I don't endorse this blender just because I use it. I was trying it out and it has some flaws, but I'm gonna fill it up with the soup and I'm gonna throw on this smoothie function to get it started. It's just gonna kind of make sure an initial blend gets everything pureed really well. Then I'm gonna check it out. Still looks a little too coarse for me, to be honest. So a few things is, I'm gonna add a little bit more of the stock. There's just a little bit too much texture. I want it to be super smooth. Just gonna go in. I have about a cup left over of this stock. I'll probably add about a half cup at a time until it's the right smooth consistency that I'm looking for. I'm also gonna season it with salt. Definitely need some salt. Also some sweetener. We go in with about one to two tablespoons of honey or uh, I have some agave here. Pop the top back on and let this thing blitz again. And we really wanna pulverize this. We really don't wanna like bite onto any bits and pieces that weren't well blended. This is a nice smooth consistency that I like. Tasted it, I need a little bit more salt. I'm gonna squeeze a little bit lemon juice in there and a touch more of that honey. And then we're gonna let it go one more time. Tastes good to me. And I'm gonna take a bunch of basil and I'm gonna just sort of pop that in there and let that steep while it cools. And we can use this right away. Keep it nice and hot, but I prefer to make it a day ahead. Those flavors are gonna snuggle with each other. They're gonna marry. It's gonna be better the next day. It's also gonna make preparing some grilled cheese and tomato soup quick during the week, especially if you have kids. So we're gonna put this into quart containers and save it for later. But of course you can use it right away. It's got nice rich tomatoey flavor, but it's not tomato sauce. 
And that was always the big thing about our tomato soup on the food truck is make it feel like a soup that isn't just some kind of variation on a tomato sauce. Those vegetables, those herbs, and that paprika really come through and make it something unique. And I always give props to my brother for coming up with this guy. So now we have our tomato soup done. We can have it tonight or we can have it ready to go for tomorrow so that we can make grilled cheese sandwiches just like that. So I'll see you tomorrow. So now it's the next day. And just like we did on our food truck, tomato soup was prepped ahead of time. Now we just have to prep the actual ingredients for the grilled cheese. And again, since we're in August, and since it's my favorite combination of a regular grilled cheese, we're gonna be doing the bacon and tomato variation so we can enjoy some beautiful heirloom tomatoes while they're still in season. And then we have to make our cheese bun, which I'm making tweaks to, but before we get into that, we need to cook off some bacon. And on the truck, we use boar's head bacon. It's actually really great bacon. They have thick cut versions, but we're just gonna use the regular today. Depending on which thickness of bacon you choose, if you go thick, I would almost cut them into lardones and cook them that way. We tended to not serve whole strips of bacon in our sandwiches because they would pull out often. So we would cut them into pieces so you would get nice bites throughout the sandwich. But since we cooked a lot of bacon, we would bake them on sheet trays first. Now a wire rack is preferable, but you don't need it. And the secret is to just sort of shingle the pieces of bacon on top of each other, layering that meaty side on top of the fatty side. And as this cooks, those pieces of bacon will shrink. It'll create more space on the sheet tray and you can just arrange them in a more orderly fashion as more room makes itself available on the sheet tray. We just wanna take that and we're gonna pop that into the oven, a cold oven. And once they're in the oven, we're gonna turn the oven on to 375 degrees which is a relatively low temperature, but it's gonna work. We're gonna set a timer for 20 minutes and work on our cheese in the meantime. So if you're new here, I used to own a food truck. And if you're curious about the story behind it, I'm gonna leave the video links down in the description that'll kind of get you up to speed. So we're not gonna talk much about that today, but we are gonna talk about the cheeses that were in my three cheese blend that were the kind of centerpiece of the food truck. It was the gateway, the entry, the most comforting sandwich that we offered. And we designed it to be something that your mom definitely didn't make, but to also remind you of that thing that she did used to make. So we didn't want it to be super high end, but we wanted to use real cheeses that almost reminded you or mimicked some of the characteristics of an American cheese. American cheese melts really great, but it has no flavor. So my solution was let's use three cheeses that will bring the flavor. And the three cheeses that we used were Gruyere. Not much variety of Gruyere. Gruyere is Gruyere. And it's basically like flavorful Swiss cheese. And here we have a Robusto Gouda. It's slightly aged. You can see the tyrosine crystals in it, but it's still soft and it's meltable and it has outrageous flavor. When I eat this, to me, this is sort of what I feel like American cheese was modeled after. Even though American cheese has cheddar cheese in it, Gouda to me just reminds me of it a little bit more. So we use these two cheeses and they are aged. Since they're aged, those are expensive cheeses. So we needed to balance it out. I wanted to use a really high-end cheddar, but cheddars are too expensive. So our cheesemonger at the time suggested using Fontanella. It's a cow's milk cheese, it's not Fontina. It's got a tang flavor it melts well it sort of reminds me of a little bit like a pecorino but it, more like a semi hard cheese and so we use this it was cheap it was good it made a great cheese blend but it should have been cheddar and if money wasn't an option I would have used cheddar and so finally I'm gonna change it to cheddar because I think it's better and there's one cheddar that I've been eyeing for years, and it's this aged, sweet red, grass-fed cheddar from Barber's Farmhouse in London. And this is amazing stuff. Again, it's slightly aged. You can see the tyrosine crystals in there. That's the mark of a flavorful cheese. The only question is, when it has those, is it meltable? And when you can feel it, you wanna be able to kind of smush it. You want it to be soft. If it's too hard, if there's not enough moisture in it, it won't melt great. So these three cheeses will melt fine. They complement each other, and they'll make a fantastic cheese blend that will be the new three cheese blend for my grilled cheese going forward. The Gouda, the Gruyere, they should be easy to find. Found the sweet red grass at Whole Foods. If you can't find it, talk to a cheesemonger. Maybe they could suggest something similar or a nice cheddar that still is soft and that you like. 
should be a suitable replacement. So let's get these cheeses grated. Now I'm gonna grate them on the smaller of the two grating settings. I just want them to be like a nice finer shred. It's just gonna help the cheeses melt a little easier. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna grate about five ounces or so of each cheese. We're looking for like a one-to-one -one ratio of all of the cheeses. So I'm just gonna roughly make sure that they're all about the same weight and size and I'm gonna add them to a big bowl and get them all mixed up. Make sure all those cheeses are well blended with each other. I'm just gonna give it a taste. It's crazy good. It don't get much better than that. Let me tell you something. So now we can store it. And then let's check on our bacon. So after 20 minutes, the bacon is starting to render, but it's still nice and pale, and it has shrunk a little bit. So as we go and give them a flip to evenly cook the bacon, we're just gonna give each piece a little bit more room between the pieces, now that each piece is just a little bit smaller. So just give each piece of bacon a flip, arrange them nicely back on the sheet tray, pop them back in the oven for another 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, most of them should be pretty perfectly cooked. If they're not, cook them for five minutes more at a time. I think they can use another five to 10 minutes, so I'm just gonna leave them in there, and then when I check back, they should be perfectly golden brown. They shouldn't be stiff right now. They should still be flexible. As they cool, they will carry over cook. They will stiffen and become more crisp. Whenever you cook bacon, you wanna pull them before you think they're perfect. Then they will actually carry over to be perfect rather than like brittle and a little bit overcharred. So let's get those onto some paper towel and set those off to the side. And if you have any bacon fat left over, feel free to save that for some other cooking process, maybe uh, fresh tortillas. Now we got our perfect bacon. Just gonna let it cool down, get nice and crisp. As you can see, as it cools and dries, that flexible piece now becomes a little bit more tender of a crisp. It's not brittle, but it's a nice tender crisp. Especially for thinner bacon like this, cooking it on that low 375, there's a thin line between being perfectly crisp and being overly crisp. And just lowering the heat gives you a little bit more of a window to perfect it. So we'll set this off to the side. So now I got my tomato soup. I just need to get it on the stove, get it reheating. At the same time, I'm gonna get a cast iron, big old cast iron, my favorite thing to cook grilled cheeses in. I'm just gonna get the heat on and let this preheat. So I'm just gonna get that cast iron preheating on a nice medium heat. I'm gonna get the soup into a pan. And we're gonna get that on the heat to warm up. Normally for a soup, I'd thin it out with a little bit of water, but I want this soup thick as a dip for grilled cheese. Next, we're gonna find our firmest, most perfectly ripe, free of any blemished tomato. We're gonna cut it into relatively thin slices, get it on a paper towel, and try and just blot some of that excess moisture and set that aside. Then we're gonna get a nice Pullman loaf. No wonder bread here. And on the food truck and at home, I like to make my grilled cheeses in a sheet tray to catch any excess that spills out. I have a one third cup measuring cup. On the truck, we did about a half cup cheese per sandwich, but hey, we ain't worried about food costs at home. We'll do two thirds a cup. And I'm just gonna use a one third cup measuring cup to measure it out. One third of the cup goes onto that bottom piece of the bread. Then I'm gonna take three to four slices of that bacon and I'm just going to tear it into little bite-sized pieces like we talked about earlier. And then I'm gonna take about half of the bacon and apply it to that first layer of cheese. Then I'm gonna take those tomatoes, depending on the size, about two to three per sandwich, and I'm just gonna season with a little bit of salt and then just shingle the tomatoes on top of the bacon. Then I'm gonna add the rest of that bacon right on top of the tomatoes and then another third cup of the cheese. Close up that sandwich, gather any excess cheese that might have fallen out of the sandwich and just sprinkle it back in. And by now the cast iron should be hot. And I also have this new made in press that I have that I'm just gonna heat up on the cast iron to mimic what we did on the food truck. We have a little bit of mayo because that's what we use to cook our sandwiches, not butter. We used mayo as a fat decade ago before it was the cool thing to do. And our soup is hot, it's nice and thick, perfect. Now we're gonna just take our sandwich and place it into the cast iron pan, dry, no fat. And I'm gonna put that sandwich press right on top. And we're just gonna let that cook and just have that side of bread sort of toast dry. And as any cheese falls out, I'm just gonna sort of drag the sandwich around so that that cheese sort of gets picked up by the sandwich and becomes one. Once I peek under the sandwich and see it's getting nicely toasted, I'm gonna give it a flip. Again, drag that sandwich around the pan, pick up any of that excess cheese, and I'm gonna take a really small layer of mayo. A lot of times I see people use mayo, they use just so much of it. You don't need a lot to 
to get a nice brown. So we're just gonna use the edge of the uh, offset spatula and just make sure we have a nice thin layer, scraping off any excess. And then once that other side of bread is nicely toasted, we're gonna give it a flip and we're gonna mayo that other side. The same way, using the side of that spatula, scraping off any excess. Once we've got both of those sides mayoed and browned, if at that point the cheese is not melted, then what we're gonna do is just lower the heat and just flip the sandwich every 20 to 30 seconds to make sure we don't get too much color or too much crisp on either side of the sandwich and to allow us time for the cheese inside to fully melt. Once we peek into the sandwich and see that that cheese is fully melted, I'm gonna get it out, let it rest on a wire rack. In the meantime, we're gonna portion out a little bit of that tomato soup with a little bit of fresh basil garnish. And we're gonna cut open our grilled cheese. And what you're gonna see is a nice balanced, proportionate sandwich. Nothing should overpower each other. Everything should be complementary and balanced. And that's what makes a good grilled cheese to me, not a ridiculous amount of cheese. I've sold thousands of these grilled cheeses and without it, probably wouldn't have a food career today. It's hard to put into words what a time machine this is. The smell, the flavor, the visuals, it just launches me back to the time I ran the food truck and it's the beauty of food. And don't forget the soup, it's not an afterthought. It is thick like a dip, but it is also meant to eat on its own, sort of like a birria taco. That was a delicious trip down memory lane. I hope you give it a shot. I hope you enjoy the new blend of cheese. If you've tried the old one, let me know which one you like better. Recipe is gonna be down in the description. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself. Now, like I said, I have a ton more recipes from the food truck, like the fork green grilled cheese seen in this video right here with a cilantro sauce, a sandwich I ate almost every day for two years running the truck, along with a few other videos I think you might like. So if you wanna give them a try, click one of them on the screen. Otherwise, thanks for watching.